Hello and welcome everybody at this press conference today at the World Economic Forum in Davos. It's Thursday and today we will be talking with some distinguished speakers that have joined me here today about the topic of healthy aging. Uh, all the speakers are, as a matter of fact, from the European Union, so we'll talk also in a little bit more granularity about where we are uh, in Europe. And uh, we'll be hearing from uh, each of the speakers. We have three speakers who are researchers at the European Research Council. Next to me is Dr. Konstantinos Demetriades. Welcome. Then next to him is Dame Linda Partridge. Welcome to you too. And then at the far end is Professor Virpi Luma. Welcome to you too. And in the middle we have uh, their, I suppose their boss in a way, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, the president of the European Research Council. Welcome to you too. And then last but not least, there is Carlos Muedas, the commissioner, the European commissioner for research, uh, science and innovation. Welcome. And why don't I start immediately with you, Commissioner Muedas? Yeah, we're, talk we're talking here about healthy aging in the context of Europe. And of course, you are responsible uh, for the domain of science and, and research into that topic. Could you tell us a little bit more about why this is important for the European Commission and perhaps also why it is important for the citizens of Europe? So thank you very much and um, welcome to all of you. It's really a pleasure to be here. I mean, and I wanted to start by a couple of words to thank the scientists. I think the reason uh, of in the value of the European Union is about having this power of the network of scientists all over Europe. And uh, the main institution that we have that is able to leverage this power to a point that I've never seen in my life is the European Research Council. And the European Research Council has become really the brand of fundamental science of Europe. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, we were able to have grantees that became Nobel Prizes, six of them. We had four Fields Medal. We had five Wolf Prizes. And so uh, it was a project that became, uh, 10 years ago, something that a lot of people in Europe didn't believe. They didn't believe and uh, it was difficult to get off the ground and we were able to do it. So uh, first of all, thank you uh, to the scientists. Thank you for their word and I have all the time about Europe and uh, for their great work. But let me tell you why I think it's important to be here today as a politician. If I look ahead and I think, what are the big challenges? What are the big challenges that we have ahead of us? And I'll say three. One, as a politician, uh, I would look at climate change. The second uh, will be about the whole digital world that we're living. But the third one is about aging. And it's about aging because this will be the big challenge for politicians. You know, once uh, Chancellor Merkel said that uh, in Europe we are 7% of the world, uh, we are 25% of the GDP of the world, but our social welfare state is 50% of the whole cost of what people expense in terms of welfare. And so we have to think for the future, how can we, without reducing the services, without reducing the welfare, because that's on the DNA of Europe, what can we do to have better health? And how can we have a better output? And I think the better output that we can have is exactly about aging? How can we have a better life? How can we prevent disease? And that's what these scientists do. So their work, even if it's in very fundamental ways and uh, about curiosity-driven research, is at the end of the day about politics. And you see that in different countries in Europe, you see that people today, they are upset. They are upset because they say, look, we pay taxes, but then we don't get the services we deserve. But if we had a system that was more focused on the outputs than the inputs, then with the same amount of money, we could have better health. And, and so I think that for me, this is extremely important. And I always start when I talk to young people, I always say to young people, you know, uh, you know what's the life expectancy, what was the life ex expectancy 100 years ago? And people are always puzzled because they normally get, oh, no, it was probably 60 or 50. No, 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 it was 30 years old. 
And then we did this amazing work of today looking at the young generation, I link uh, my children, and I say, look, you're, the probability that you go uh, over 100 is amazing, but I want you to have a good life, and that's what this research is about. So uh, as a politician, I, I just wanted to have these two words, one about the link of the work of these scientists from the very fundamental research to the day-to-day -day of people. Uh, I wanted to thank the president of the ERC, which has been uh, the engine of this institution, um, and I wanted to give you the incentive and to tell you that in our proposal for the next program of Science of Europe, uh, we're talking about increasing the budget of the ERC that today was around 13 billion for seven years to almost 18 billion euros. So that's the importance we really give to fundamental science. So thank you for inviting me. I feel very humble uh, around uh, this table. So now I will uh, just listen. And if there's any political question, please ask me. Yes, absolutely. And I've no doubt that uh, we have some questions at the end. So uh, in about 10 minutes, we'll come uh, back to you and the other speakers. But first, uh, you mentioned what can we do to have a better uh, health because uh, uh, that's a challenge for people now that we are getting older. But I want to take a step back and ask perhaps Dame Partridge or Dame Linda, um, what is actually the situation in Europe right now? What, how old are people getting and how healthy are people? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that before we turn to your research? Indeed. And I also am delighted to be here. Very glad to be able to talk about aging in this wonderful context. So we are indeed all living longer. It's actually been going on for about 200 years in developed countries. And the problem is that healthy lifespan is not keeping up with the overall increase. So by the age of 80, most Europeans have at least eight different medical conditions. So a big burden of multimorbidity. And the indications are from the current demographics that the increase in lifespan will continue at least until 2030. So we're going to see a growing population of elderly in many countries against a background of falling birth rates. So the ratio of old to young is also changing. So the real challenge for the kind of research that we're doing and that is funded by the ERC is to try to tackle this period of ill health at the end of life, to try to keep people healthier for longer before the end of life. And happily, aging is proving to be a very malleable process. So work with animals has shown that a lot of different interventions, genetic, environmental, particularly diet, but also drugs, can increase lifespan as it happens. But what we're really interested in is health, and it can keep them healthier for longer. So a quite simple intervention, eating less, dietary restriction, can protect laboratory animals, including rhesus monkeys against multiple different aging-related diseases, so dementia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and others. So the thought in the field is, perhaps instead of waiting for these aging-related diseases to happen and then treating them, we could instead develop a preventative medicine based on what we now know about the biology of aging and the interventions that can affect it. And my own work here is, is primarily um, based on the use of drugs because we've discovered so much about the fundamental mechanisms of aging now that we know how to target some of them, sometimes with already approved drugs, actually, for aging-related diseases. So there's quite a, a prospect, rather than for new drug development, for drug repurposing in this area. So I'm particularly working with, with uh, three different drugs um, in a variety of different animal models. And what we're finding is we can keep the animals healthy for longer. They don't get the age-related conditions that their particular species gets. And I think the prospect for the future is definitely prevention, probably based on the use of a cocktail of different drugs that target these different features of the aging process. I think that's the really exciting prospect that we're potentially looking forward to. And I think it could do a lot to tackle this growing burden of multimorbidity at the end of life. 
Excellent. Um, we look forward to that, of course. Just one, one question. Uh, I know that uh, there's now increasingly talk in popular press about people living 100 years and 100 year life. Are we actually uh, close to that uh, for babies that are born today? Or how old do they, do they get in Europe, Europe? Well, as you know, prediction is very difficult, especially of the future. Uh, but if current demographic trends hold up, then yes, we're looking at a very significant proportion, perhaps even 20% of the babies born today living to 100. But of course, there are unhappily contrary trends. The obesity, the diabetes in the young could send that one back. But potentially, yes. So we, we have be. to be careful what we wish for. Uh, thank you, uh, Dame Linda. And then I want to turn to your colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Konstantinas Demetriadis. Uh, you do similar research uh, into uh, what is possible, actually, uh, with uh, medicine, with uh, 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 biology. Could you tell us a little bit more from your perspective um, is it indeed a good idea um, to, to use the medicine that we have right now, uh, or should we rather take a step back and do some more basic research? Thank you very much. Um, I will try to explain our research um, in, a, uh, in a way that is as simple as possible. This is usually tricky um, because we're working on the very fundamental processes and uh, sometimes we fall into the technicalities. Um, so you just heard uh, about um, uh, different dietary uh, 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 regimes that we have already and different drugs that can mimic these processes. Um, however, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. So uh, although we know a lot, um, we're not there yet. And uh, we cannot uh, simply get a sip of this drug every morning uh, and, and, and stay healthy and live forever. And the reason behind that is that um, we don't quite understand uh, uh, the very fundamental processes um, uh, that are affected when we touch upon um, uh, these cellular uh, mechanisms. So our ERC-funded work aims to understand how precisely these molecular mechanisms work in, in healthy cells and what goes wrong in aging and, and age-related diseases. And uh, I believe that this way we will be able to identify more precise and more targeted ways in order to modulate these processes um, in, in the right organs and, and uh, at the right time and to the right extent. Um, so in particular, we're looking at nutrient sensing. Um, so this uh, aims to understand how our cells sense the availability of nutrients in their environment in order to modulate uh, or adapt their processes accordingly. And we know that this is very, very important because these exact mechanisms are the ones that are very commonly uh, dysregulated in many different diseases. And uh, we know that these very same mechanisms uh, go bad uh, as we age. I understand. And so uh, you're hoping to find out in the coming years more about those mechanisms, I suppose, and to find more effective uh, ways of, uh, let's say, preventing or treating uh, aging uh, uh, diseases, diseases that go with aging. Yeah, that's correct. So we. Our, our purpose is to understand better what we do before we actually give it a try. Because this way, uh, we might be able to improve the efficiency uh, of the overall process of clinical trials and, and, and the application of these findings uh, all the way to uh, patients or to the uh, senior people. Yeah, and uh, as, uh, pr um, sorry, not professor, but uh, at least Commissioner Moeda said, uh, with a welfare state that's uh, costing us 50% of our uh, of our budget, uh, it may indeed be a good idea to look into the effectiveness uh, of how to achieve that, especially with so many people aging right now. I want to turn now to uh, the last uh, speaker of the researchers, at least, Professor Virpi Luma. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your research uh, into this matter? Yes, thank you. Um, so studying human aging is, is a little bit difficult in the sense that um, the study subject lives as long as the researcher, so 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 we are facing a little bit difficulties there. And uh, but nevertheless, uh, in addition to this fantastic lab research uh, on model organisms, we also need to study uh, longitudinally um, the aging processes in in humans as they grow older. So I've taken a little bit different approach in my research, and I've looked back into the history to try to understand how we age today. So, so ERC really transformed my research when they gave me a grant to computerize thousands and thousands of um, family records uh, from my country in Finland so that I can build 15 generations of um, pedigree following people from birth to death. And, and, and using these records, we can look at many factors that influence differences in lifespan between people like genetic factors, environmental factors, um, socioeconomic differences, and so on. One particular question that I've um, become very interested in is, is, is why do we actually 
um, live as long as we do. So, so what sort of lifespan did we evolve to have? And, and we are a little bit strange species in that uh, we live decades after we can't even have babies anymore. No other species practically has this. So, so, um, so it's been a dilemma. And, and one idea I had was that perhaps because our babies are so much effort and need a lot of care from the mothers, uh, we basically evolved to become grandmothers uh, who can't have their own babies anymore, but still are really much needed for the success of their families to, to raise these grandchildren. So, um, so that's what I've been studying. And we've, we've found, my team has found really big benefits of the grandmothers for the success of the families, for the survival of the grandchildren and, and so on. So, so that was a really key finding. But uh, of course, um, uh, everything is changing in the modern world and, and people live now further and further away from their grandparents, uh, which we can also study with these fantastic data we've collected. So, um, so there's a problem that the elderly today actually spend most of their time with other elderly rather than with their families like used to be the case. And I think we should pay more attention to this because birth rates are declining, people are citing problems with childcare and social networks as, as one of the key reasons for this. And if, um, if we could improve the healthy uh, lifespan and, and the healthy years at the end of the life, perhaps then actually if, if, if these elderly were more involved um, in their families, like always been the case, uh, or something else um, which stimulates them, there might be actually multiple benefits for, for not just one generation, but several generations. Uh, in terms of their health, in terms of actually economic factors and social factors. So, it's absolutely uh, fascinating. And I want to ask you, on behalf of the fellow men in the room, though, uh, if grandmothers have that f social function of, uh, of growing so old, uh, what about the grandfathers? Oh, I hate that question. <laughs> so I studied mainly historical families. And I, I hate to say, but in the historical families, grandfathers didn't really have much of a benefit for the grandchildren in the same way as the grandmothers did. But that's not to say that the grandfathers today would be useless because, of course, our society has completely changed. So, so, so both grandparents today are much more involved, hands-on, uh, well, in, in, in these issues. We'll see what happens. Um, and I didn't do this on purpose, but, uh, of course, we have a, a last speaker, uh, President uh, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon of the European uh, Research Council. Um, you have heard uh, uh, Commissioner Moeda speak about his ambitions to raise the budget of the European Research Council. I heard, I noted down, from 13 to 18 billion, quite a big uh, increase. Could you tell us a little bit to, for what benefit uh, this money is used and what you, what you have in, in mind for the, the, the European Research Council going forward? Thank you very much for that. First of all, I'm a grandfather, so I'm uh, very pleased to acknowledge that at this moment. Uh, no, of course, it's uh, very important what we heard from Commissioner Moedas, but I think it's uh, very directly connected to what we heard from the scientists themselves, namely that uh, we, by developing the European Research Council, uh, I think the European Union and the uh, European Commission was uh, had the duty to do that, developed a program which really uh, has been uh, uh, stimulating and uh, making uh, Europe more uh, stimulating the researchers and making Europe more attractive. So you heard that this uh, huge variety of uh, research which has been uh, developed uh, at uh, our level, we are covering all fields of science, and you heard some samples here focused on uh, one topic. Of course, this topic is extremely relevant for the uh, as a fantastic societal impact, and uh, also uh, also shows that the concerns of people is really addressed. And what maybe one element element I wanted to I would like to make here is uh, the fact that very often the scientists are more or less accused which is maybe too much but uh, people think they are living in their um, really ivory tower and I think it's something we see at the ERC level at the completely differently because actually uh, the researchers are submitting uh, their most ambitious ideas to us and we select uh, of course we, we are selective but uh, we select uh, some of the very best and uh, definitely what we see is a fantastic impact on the level of research at the European level. And this is, of course, something which uh, is very important at this stage where other continents are investing massively into research. I'm thinking about uh, Asia in particular. 
But I think uh, Europe, it's uh, not as for, for the reasons that Commissioner Moritz put forward, namely has a very special uh, situation of, uh, s I mean, small number of people, uh, already uh, quite still uh, very advanced countries, but also in terms of social benefits, very high social benefits. So we need to rebalance this. Maybe my, my key point I would like to make also concerning the European Research Council is its breadth. So at the moment, we are over typically at 9,000 grants we have been given, which have been employing more than 60,000 people in, of course, many different institutions. We are now reach uh, 800 institutions which benefited. And uh, of course, uh, for us, the future is uh, we want, it's critical that we can keep the quality and that quality, scientific quality should be the only criteria on which the uh, sciences, uh, the projects uh, are, are selected because we know that as soon as we get away from this, then the whole thing is going to fall apart. And uh, this really made a difference for, for the success of the European Research Council. And we are very pleased to see when we look at the, uh, really the, the studies we, we, uh, we have been doing, or even some other people have been doing, that the ERC now is ranked as one of the most successful funding mechanism in the whole world. And this is not our figures, it's the figures of, of uh, really independent uh, evaluators. And just to give and cl close on, on this note, in our case, we, with our ex post evaluation of the projects, we see that uh, typically about uh, between 70 and 80 percent of the project um, uh, every year, because we do that uh, on a yearly basis, have either a breakthrough or a major scientific advance which for us is uh, very comforting, shows that our choices have been definitely very reasonable and uh, really we know we have uh, provided uh, resources that uh, researchers have used uh, remarkably well. Very well. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bourguignon. And now I want to turn to the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, Stephen Fiddler from the Wall Street Journal. If you can stand up and, uh, with the microphone yeah, and ask the question. Yeah, thank you. A couple of different uh, questions. Um, I wonder if the researchers could, uh, I mean, if you have extend healthy life, um, do you kind of necessarily thereafter have a, a period of unhealthy life? So are you just pushing back the, say, eight years of unhealthy life to the future? So you'd start to, or do you conk out, you know, much more quickly after your healthy life? I mean, is, is that the prospect there after the healthy life? And the second one is a question about Brexit, um, I'm afraid. <laughs> and what would be the relation of the European Research Council, or what can you say about the relation of the European Research Council to the UK after Brexit? So I, I think I can tackle your first question. Um, I think there are two quite encouraging lines of evidence that if you try to compress the unhealthy period at the end of life, you actually compress it. So you don't just draw everything out. So the first is that people who die at really advanced ages, so well into their 90s or over 100 or even over 110, often have relatively little ill health at the end of their lives. So it's possible to combine a long life with a short period of ill health at the end of it. They're there. We can see that happen. And some of these interventions that I mentioned, particularly dietary restriction, extends lifespan and often makes it rather difficult to say what the animal died of. So with your control animals, it's usually pretty obvious it was a tumour or something else that you can see pathologically. With the animals that are dietarily restricted, in a sense they just died. It's really hard to say what problem was. So again, there really seems to be a compression of that morbid period at the end of life. So I think it is achievable. And of course that's what we should aim for rather than simply stretching everything out. Thank you. And then now for the uh, elephant in the room. We, were, we thought, we actually prepared this press conference and we thought that we were going to have a different elephant in the room because actually one of the researchers, Virpi, uh, has done research on elephants. But uh, we, we can talk about that later. But So the elephant in the room, Brexit. Very, very happy to, to uh, answer that question. But uh, I was thinking about the dietary restrictions <laughs> that I have to have. So I'll ask that question to Lida afterwards. Um, uh, you know, I'm, it is a, such a sad situation uh, for research and science. Uh, and I say these from the bottom of my heart. Because in these five years, I saw and I visited all these researchers in the UK, in other parts of Europe, and 
my conclusion is that we really need each other. So the UK needs Europe and the European Union, and the European Union needs the UK. And so as a commissioner for research and science, what I could do and I did was to try to open my arms for the future in terms of our proposal for the next program. And so if there is an agreement in between the European Union and the UK, then it will be very easy for the UK look into the framework program, the next program of science, and it is there in my proposal. It's just very easy. The UK can join. Can join, and we have a very simple system where uh, nobody, in terms of amount of money, the UK will pay their part, we will pay our part. So imagine that you have 10 scientists, five are from the UK and five are from other countries, then the UK will pay their part and we will pay our part. And so it's a very fair system. And so I, I think that we have proposed a really a very, very good deal that makes possible that uh, the point will not be about the money. I think that the researchers in the UK really want to participate and we can ask that question to Linda, not because of the money, it's because of the network, because of the ability that you have to do. But everything I did, and I've put these uh, with, uh, really with very careful in my proposal, it does not depend on me, it doesn't depend on us, it depends on an umbrella deal, on the deal above. And so if that deal exists, then I think that the doors are open. And the same doors are open to countries like Canada, uh, and countries like the New Zealand that we've been talking, and Australia. So we want this program to be really open to the world. The really uh, amazing thing that I've seen in this program is to see scientists that come from the United States and uh, work with us, or other parts of the world, from China, from Japan. And the president of the ERC, he basically, I mean, he, I think that uh, nobody has traveled as he has traveled. Uh, to the expense of his health, I, I imagine, of doing these, just telling really, you are part of it. Uh, the Europe is an open system, and the European system of science has to be open to the world. So, uh, Stephen, I, I'm sorry that I cannot answer the first part of the question, which is the political question in between the UK and the EU. But on the second part, I think that we have proved that we really want the UK as part of the game. So we've done everything in our proposal for Horizon Europe for the UK to be. Thank you, Commissioner. And then I think we have time for one more question before we close the press conference. And if there's none, I will ask... Can I uh, just... Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I had to... I, when uh, Virpi was uh, uh, describing her work, I was thinking about the relationship of her work with policy making. And one of the interesting experiences that came to me was this experience in Japan, where they have put a senior living facility next to a kindergarten. And so you can see that the work of a scientist can then be, at the end, you can think about solutions. So if the grandparents are not anymore with the families, probably we can find other solutions. And, and the results of that work are very interesting. So it's, uh, uh, for the people that know it, it will be interesting to see and to, to link. So I, I'm, I'm always trying to do these links because I think there's a lot of link even with the very fundamental. I mean, you, what you're doing is, is fundamental research, but we can find that uh, for the future of Europe is important. Very well, and uh, with that, uh, I think we've uh, indeed come to the end of our uh, press conference. I want to thank all the speakers, and I want to thank people both here and at home watching on the live stream, and we will see you soon with another update. Thank you so much. Thank you.